now, I'd like to invite Pastor Paul up to the platform. Okay, it's kind of a miracle that I remembered the announcements. <laughs> they had to be important because that was the last thing on my mind. A good deal. So we here at Resonate Church, and the fun thing about all this, you know, you're going to be learning more about our church and vision and what we got going on over the next several weeks, which is really going to be exciting, which will also help you to get more excited about inviting more people just based on where we're going to be going and doing. And so fun things in the future. I love it. I can't wait. One of those things that we're doing is, um, you know, obviously we have men's uh, uh, fraternity that goes on. We have the return that, that happens here. Our men get, uh, go through an event uh, through the return and just get reconnected with God. It's really kind of great. We have our women that are doing something very similar. And uh, it's called The Well. And we have several women, 12, or is it more? 12? 12 women that are going to be going on uh, this week, I believe. And we're going to pray over them. And they're going to be going on a journey to be able to go have an encounter with the Lord, much like what our men do. And so if I could have those women and maybe their families and friends, but I want the women to line up right here. Yes. Right here. I saw the discomfort on some of your faces for being on the stage, so I'm like, I'm, I'm going to have you do this this time, okay? And friends and family, if you want to come gather behind them, we're going to pray. That'd be good. Staff members, people, strangers, please come. And uh, we'll... <laughs> awesome. Good deal. Yay. Yeah. You qualify. All right. Thank you, Dale. <laughs> okay. He's my friend. I can do that to him. And... Uh, and if anybody's stranger than him, it's me. So, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, I exhorted you ladies last time, uh, just what the Lord's going to do in your hearts and what he's going to do in your lives. And just for the sake of all you here, we at Resonate Church, our goal is to build strong men and strong women. Now, that doesn't mean that women try to become men and to become, you know, strong in that sense. We need men to be strong, strong men that will lay down their lives for their families, do those types of things, protect the innocent and the weak to be able to be leaders. We need women to be strong women, to be that nurturing voice of the Lord. But you know, the gifts of the Spirit will work through you and be expressed through you just like they would through a man, but they're gonna come through in a different way, possibly. Something that God needs. He needs men and women being men and women in the body of Christ, amen? And of course, the healings that need to take place for all of us to be strong in the Lord. Because when we're broken, we are weak, like anything that would be broken. You know, if I had a pencil and it had a crack in it, you ever, you know what I mean? And for me, being a little ADD, I would always be tapping them or doing something and getting in trouble. And then if it was cracked because I was bending it or something, poof, poof, goes flying, hit somebody, and you get in trouble. I don't know, that probably happened to somebody other than me too. Anybody? <laughs> Thank you. Praise the Lord. All right. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, never, yeah. When we're broken, we're weak. And to be strong, we have to be whole. Amen? And so we're going to pray over these ladies, and I want you just to believe with us. Father, I thank you that this is a seed, just like it was for the men. We send these women to be a seed of victory. And we thank you that as they go on this journey, great things are in store for them. I pray right now for all the workers that will be there, that you give them divine insight, direction. We release the gifts of your spirit to work uh, in these women, to be able to minister to our women. I thank you for prophetic words. I thank you for words that will bring change and correction, direction, uh, encouragement. I thank you for impartation of gifts. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for great travel there and back. I didn't pray for that last time. Smooth travel as you fly. Smooth travel as you come back. Hallelujah. We pray for the vans that will be taking you there, that they will work and function properly. We thank you for these things. In the name of Jesus, we call you blessed, and we send you forth, and we call you back. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you. And this. Ladies, thank you for doing this. Seriously, thank you for doing it. Choosing to be a disciple 
is what every disciple has to do. I choose to take steps. I choose to spend money. I choose to take my time to be a disciple, to grow, to become better, to become stronger, to be able to fulfill my destiny. Thank you for being a part of this church. Together, we're strong. Amen? <laughs> Love you guys. See ya. Boom, boom. Lord, help us all as we proceed. Father, love you, thank you. We're here today absolutely because of you. It's because of your word and your, who you are that we're here. And we, I ask that you would deepen our relationship with you and help us to grow. I thank you for the spirit being manifest here and doing whatever's needed, healing, encouraging, setting free. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. New game that I'm playing, golf. Loving this game. Orange. Orange. My first Harley was... I love orange. It is my absolute favorite color in the whole world. And why, I don't know, but it just is. And there's, there's just something heavenly about orange. I don't know what I'm going to do when my golf game gets better because I'll have to change these. And I hope they have orange. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Not happening. Well, golf, maybe, or, maybe orange grips or something. But, you know... If you would have asked me a few years ago if you're a golfer, you know, I would golf. I would golf several times a year. I'd taken a few lessons, whatever, you know what I mean? If you would have asked me if I was a golfer, I would have said yes. But in reality, I was not a golfer until this year. This year is when I decided to get really serious about playing this game. The thing I love about this game is there's so many little nuances that, that you have to learn, little skills that you have to learn to be able to conquer this game and to, you know, and it takes practice. It takes a lot of practice. And it's amazing, this little club right here, I have a gap wedge in my hand. And this is really designed in its, 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 its design is to get the ball, you know, up in the air quickly and, and to launch something high and to get it onto the green or out of the sand or whatever. Its design is to do that. But in things I've been learning about golf, it's kind of interesting that there's, a, there's something called the bounce. And I used to think that the bounce on a club was like, oh, poop. <laughs> I bounced it, you know, whatever. But it's actually, you want to use that. <laughs> Got a hard surface or whatever, you know, you're getting, you just whatever. And this has a really high angle on it. And if you really strike down on the ball, you know, you're going to pop it up quick, you know, whatever. You get a nice full swing on this thing, you know, and uh, you're just going to launch that thing like, like monster high. The other day, though, I was playing and Dale can witness to this because he was there. My ball was like in the woods. Never happens to the pros, right? No, it happens to them too. This is part of golf. Golf is managing a bunch of disasters is really what golf is. And, uh, you know, and, and when you're an amateur, you just manage a lot more of them. And so my ball is like off in the, you know, it's like, boom, got a great bounce, came back a little bit, you know, but it's behind a tree. I've got about zero room to like, take a stroke or anything and 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 so what I did is I took this club because it, I, I needed a short club because of where I was and I de-lofted it and what that does it takes the lift out of it and I just punch that ball and this thing just comes out just so beautiful goes on the green I feel like Tiger Woods you know what I mean and it was like oh I am a real golfer why because I took the tool in my hand and I had to adapt it to the situation so I would have called myself a golfer, but now I really am a golfer. Oh, by the way, if you go to the golf outing, these are going to be given away. So you might win some new golf clubs. If you would have asked me, like I said, if you're a golfer, I would have said yes. But now this year, if you ask me a golfer, I'm a golfer. Why? Because when I watch golf, watch people play, I'll ask questions, I'll look, I examine, boom, I practice, I learn, I improve. Pastor, why in the heck are you talking about golf? Because I think a lot of people say they're Christians. But man, you put them in a difficult situation, they don't know what the heck to do. They're just swinging the same thing, doing the same stuff all the time, and they're really not adapting. They're not really taking the word of God, the tools that they need. You know, that, that gap wedge, 
You know, you're not going to tee off with that thing. And if you don't even know what that means, you don't do a long shot with that one. Why? Because you can't, unless you're Tiger Woods, you know, or some of these newer players. But, you know, it's like the wrong tool. And to really be a Christian, it's called really being a disciple. And a disciple is a learner. And a learner is taking the tools of the Word of God and learning how to apply them to every situation. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start talking to you about something the Bible calls hope. And where does that hope come from? And how do I establish that hope in my life? You see, my golf game now has a lot more hope. It has a lot more expectation of good things than it did a year ago. You know what I mean? I go there and I'm pretty confident, even when I'm shouldn't be. I'm pretty confident. It's just the way that I approach life. You know what I mean? I'm going for it. I'm going for the gold. You know what I mean? But I have a lot more tools now to really make that happen. And God gives us tools. He gives us tools to win life. And a lot of that has to do with hope. And hope, you know, there's a difference between natural human hope and biblical hope. Natural human hope, you know, hope in general is expectation of something good. It is that. But the Bible, the thing that differentiates between the two is this. Let me just kind of read a couple of the, the things that, uh, that I wrote down. It says, there's a difference between human natural hope and biblical hope. The first is based upon chance. The latter is based on uh, trust in God and his faithfulness and his reliability. You'll see why I mean that in just a minute. Even hope based on uh, anything, let's say medical science, or let's say, you know, the stock market or whatever, or investments or whatever, you take all the data, you take all these things, you take what the doctors say, and the doctors themselves saying, according to what we've seen in the past and what we've learned, and we apply these things, we hope for this outcome, but it's not sure. Statistically, most of the time this is going to work out, but it's not Sure, they're practicing medicine. I don't know if you know that. I'm practicing golf. They're practicing medicine. The more that they practice it, the better they get. But still, there are things that are beyond their control. Not bad. They're not evil. They're very good. They're they're awesome. We need to learn, and we're going to find out today, that the Word of God gives us an eternal hope that is unshakable and is sure if we learn how to apply faith to what the Word of God says. I'll explain it. We'll talk about it. You're going to get better at it as it goes, just like you do with golf. Listen to this statement. Uh, When humans give up hope for whatever reason, they lose the will to live, to fight, and the will to make things better. Hope makes you want to make things better. Come on, somebody. It's amazing. You, get, you, you hope for something in the future, new golf clubs, new motorcycle, new house, new whatever. It's amazing what you'll do to make those things better, to come to pass or whatever. Listen to this quote by Hale Lindsey. He says, man can live about 40 days without food, about three days without water, about eight minutes without air, but only for one second without hope. That's interesting. You can live a while without food. You can live a while without water. You can live less time without air and man without hope. You've already started the death cycle. Now in the scripture in Hebrews 11, 1, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That word hope is a Greek word that I want to share with you right now. And this is what it means. It says to look forward with confidence to that which is good and beneficial. To look forward to with confidence. You see, the word of God will give us a hope that has confidence. And it's important that we know the word of God so that we can apply that with what? Confidence. And we can have a confident hope. This is something that the world doesn't have. The word dictionary, the Webster Dictionary says to, to hope, it says to cherish a desire with anticipation. To want something to happen or to be true, hope for promotion, hope for the best, I, you know, those types of things. The difference between biblical hope and natural hope is this, what is it based upon? 
I say this to young people all the time and, and people that are saying and praying for something. You know, I'm praying for healing. I'll ask, based upon what? Because faith is always based upon something. Your hope is going to be based upon something. And I hope it turns out. Well, you know, you're, you're hoping in the stat statistical uh, probability that it might work or you're either hoping in an eternal thing, which is the word of God, which we'll look at here in just a little bit. What am I hoping? At? What is my hope based upon? How many of you know when you have hope, you have joy? How many of you know that when you have hope, you have strength? When you have hope and joy, the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's amazing how you will be a strong person no matter what's going on in your life. Part of this teaching, if we, are, if we get to it, we're going to look at some of Paul's journeys. And Paul talks about in Corinthians about all these things he went through for the sake of the gospel. In Acts 27, you see him going to Rome and just all the stuff that he went through to be able to get there. I mean, it's amazing. People don't listen to him. They get shipwrecked. He has to float to an island. He gets bit by a snake. Come on, now he's on an island, deserted, you know what I mean? All these things, but yet he knew and he had the hope that he was going to Rome because that's what the Lord told him and you know, he was going there and different things like this. It's amazing what you can endure and have strength and joy in the midst of if you have hope. We're gonna look at a scripture here and I'll go into many examples about why there's many, I, I, I have no anticipation I'm gonna get out of this first scripture because I didn't first service. But I have several scriptures of examples of the biblical authors putting their hope and trust in God and the reasons why they did. Okay? And so we're going to start with 2 Peter 1, 19. 2 Peter 1, 19. It says, and, and I'll, go, I'll through, go through 21 and then we'll go back through it. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So let's look at this. And it says, we have a prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in dark places. You see, the word of God will give you hope and confidence and assurance in the midst of trials or problems. You know, uh, uh, trials come, like I said, in a golf game. And, you know, I, I don't know if any of you, you know, played golf and you ended up in a sand trap. <laughs> they call it a trap for a reason, all right, because you're going to get stuck in that thing if you don't know what to do. You know what I mean? I've been there and you wouldn't believe how terrible I was when I would get caught in that sand trap. The trap was a good word for it for me. You know what I mean? I am like, boom, I'm trying to hit that thing out of there. I am, boom. Sand is flying. My ball is not. You know what I mean? It's a terrible thing. But man, once you learn and you practice, you know, just that little stroke, you know what I mean? And you can just get that thing. You can pop that thing out of there. It is amazing. I don't fear sand anymore. James says, count it all joy, my brother, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And that word testing means proving out, working out. You work out your faith. You practice. You get into that sand trap. Man, I, get a, I go to the practice range, put a line in the sand in the sand trap, man. I would just be boom, boom, you know, and just kind of boom, just kind of hitting that sand and just hitting it in the right spot and working on it and stuff like that. That's why when now I go to the sand, I've worked out my sand game. So now I can do it with excellence. God says, work out your faith. Count it all joy when you fall into a sand trap of life. Come on, somebody, so that you can work out your faith and let faith have its perfecting work that you become mature and complete, lacking nothing. And so in other words, I can't become a golfer until I practice. I can't become a Christian I mean, I can be a believer, I can be a Christian, but I can't be a disciple until I get into that sand trap and start working. The trials of life will destroy you or they're going to make you a disciple. And so the hope that I have is this. I'm in this thing, but I'm going to get out of it. And I'm going to take the word of God and I'm going to take my faith and I'm going to apply this and I'm going to learn to get out of that. And pretty soon these little trials, man, they're easy to get out of. 
Oh my gosh, the trials when I was a young Christian, the things that did would make me stay up at night, I laugh at now. Seriously. I mean, crazy, okay? And I'll give an example of that in just a minute. Let's look at the next phrase that says, until the dawn and the morning star rises in your hearts. This is, this, this is, the awakening of that word and it becomes alive to you and we let that, that, that thing rise and shine, come on, on the problem. Satan is trying to bring darkness on you. You let the hope of the word of God in your faith brings a light out, come on somebody, and light dispels darkness, right? And so you take the word into this problem but what happens many times in very young Christians' lives or very immature Christians' lives is the trial drags them into deeper darkness. You never get out of the sand trap. You're just digging a deeper hole and pretty soon we see the top of your head and sand flying out and that's it. You see, the sand traps of life, the little things that we go through are designed to make you mature. You see, we're designed by God to put on the armor of God and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and apply it to the things that come into our life. Oh, listen to this. I looked it up in the New Living and I kind of liked it. Let me see. James 1.22. It says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. I'll read it to you again. New Living Translation. I, this is a surprise to you. So let's, uh, it's James 1.22, if you want to, do we have the New Living Translation? I have no idea, Joe. If we don't, just listen to it again. It says, but don't just listen to God's word. How many of us go to church, we don't take notes, we don't remember what I said after I leave, after you leave? Heck, I gotta look at my own notes to remember what I preached. And I preached it. And you see, and you might be good at it, I don't know. There's times where I'm listening and I grab onto something and something speaks to me and I go, you know what, I gotta learn how to apply that into my life. You know what, and if I go home with one thing to apply in my life, that meeting was a success. You know what I mean? So you don't necessarily need notes, but you gotta be listening with the idea, I'm taking something home and I'm applying it. I'm gonna take it and use it. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. In other words, this is what we should do in every trial, okay? This will produce hope. What does God's word say? Not what would Jesus do? Because can I share this with you? You're not Jesus. Jesus might handle that problem a little differently than you would. Okay, seriously, the dude walked on water. Come on, he multiplied a little boy's lunch and fed 5,000. The dude was pretty on top of his game. All right. Raises people from the dead, okay? I believe you can get there. I believe that we can all get there. Amen. I don't think anybody in this room's there yet. I'm just saying, you know what I'm saying? We're pushing towards it. We're seeing things happen. Come on, somebody. I believe we got a couple miracles this month by praying for some babies and stuff like this. You know what I mean? I've seen things happen. I've literally seen people raised from the dead. I've seen crippled people healed and walk and things like this. I've seen those things. I have prophesied national ministries, what they'd be doing, and they're doing them to this day. You know what I mean? They're fulfilling them around the world. I've seen these. I've worked in these things. I've seen them happen. I've seen miracles. I'm not like Jesus yet. So what would Jesus do might be a un little, little bit unrealistic for me. It's got to be my goal, though. I'm going to grow up and be just like him. But in the situation that I'm in right now, I need to ask this, I think. What does the word say about my situation? And Lord, how do I apply that to what I'm dealing with right now? How do I deal with it? Now, somebody who's played golf for a long time, you know what I'm saying? And stuff like this, Dale's played golf a lot longer than I have. So when we go golfing, sometimes I go, dude, what do I do? Because I know you've seen it. Because I've seen your swing. You've been in everything. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so sometimes 
a more experienced golfer can tell, you know, that's how I learned how to do that shot around the tree. Dale, Dale just said, listen, this is what you're going to do. You're going to punch it. You're not going to be able to follow through. You're just going to have to punch it out there and let the club, just trust the club. Well, I've got to just trust the word. I've got to take the word of God. And sometimes you might need somebody that's a little bit more experienced than you, helping you apply it to where you're at. Because your faith level might be here. And if I'm telling you to believe here, you're not going to make it. And a more experienced player will go, I remember when I've been there. This is kind of how you do it. This is how it's going to feel. This is how we're going to apply this. And I'm going to join my faith with yours. And we're going to come out of this thing. We're going to, we're going to do something. We're, we're going to have something happen here. You know, I've gone into some really pretty tough situations. And I was like, listen, I'm bringing the kingdom right now. So don't you worry. Don't you worry. I'm bringing the kingdom. Been there, been around a little while, seen some things. What is our goal when the prophetic word, what do I do to it? I got to bring a light to that darkness. What is it? It's the word that's going to produce the hope. Then I got to let it rise in my heart and I got to apply it, put on my armor and stand and do it. You know what I'm saying? And then I just need to keep practicing the word. Knowing that the word will work for me as it will for anybody else. Why? Because it's of no private interpretation. In other words, by his stripes you're healed. We'll just use healing. By your stripes you're healed. Well, it'll work for you, but I, I, I don't know about for you, Ron. I, you know... <laughs> Come on, man, please. You better have Dale pray for you because he's got it, man. You don't, you know what I mean? That's not what the word of God is. The word of God's not a word to one and not to another. Why? Because the redemption that he gave was once and for all. When he died on that cross and he took those stripes and he did these things and he brought that salvation, he wasn't thinking, hmm, I, yeah, I like you. I, th I think I'll give it all to you. But Terry, I... I don't, uh, okay, maybe, all right, you know, but you know, you know what I'm saying? But that's how a lot of people treat God. You know, he would do it for her because she's so nice and she's so good, but I don't think he would do it for, what you're saying is God plays favorites. But the word of God is sure all, this is part of the teaching later on, all the promises of God are in him Yes, and in him, amen. You know what that means? It'll work for you. It's a prophetic word made more sure. It's not of a private interpretation. When you get the interpretation, it'll work for you and 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 it'll work for you. Work for you. Love that about our God. Isn't that cool? Yeah. <laughs> James 1, 2 says, count it all joy, my brother, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have, what I like to say, is perfecting work that you might be mature and complete, lacking nothing. We did have that one earlier. James 1, 20, 1 and just count it all joy, my brother. This is where you practice. Count it out joy, my brother, when you fall into various trials, and I'm just going to practice, I'm going to practice, and I'm going to practice, and I'm going to practice, and I'm going to practice. I love going to the driving range. I'll grab one club. I'll hit 50, 60 balls with one club, just working on one thing, just working on one stroke, just working on one thing. Go to the sand, dump a bucket of balls in the sand. I'm going to hit every one of these out to my target. Bible says that that same thing happens to us with these little trials that come. You know, you have trials. They're designed by, well, can I, I, this is not a doctrinally accurate statement. So I probably shouldn't say it that way. But trials are going to come to your life. They are. You're not redeemed from problems. Great. Not going to happen. Sorry. Well, I got saved and I thought everything was going to be great. Might get worse. <laughs> I decided to be a tither and everything went to pot. Yep. Awesome. What are you going to do with it? You're going to stand on the word? What would the word do? Are you going to keep faithful to the word, standing on the eternal word? Because if you will, the outcome will be what the word says. When I was a new, new baby Christian, learned 
1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes I'm healed. Matthew 8, 17, himself took my infirmities, bore my sicknesses, learned many other scriptures. I was going, you know what, God's a healer. And I remember I got a headache one day. And I said, you know what, I'm going to pray for myself. Laid hands on my head. And I said, in the name of Jesus, headache, you go, and boom. And I dropped my hands, and I go, God, it didn't go away. <laughs> You've done the same thing. All right, so <laughs> maybe our stories will be similar from this point on, or maybe not. I don't know. So the Lord speaks to me and goes, listen, you would give an aspirin 30 minutes to work. He goes, you have more faith in aspirin, and you'll give it more time to work than you'll let me work. I said, ooh. <laughs> All right, I have more faith in aspirin than I have in you. Okay, Lord, I believe that laying hands on myself is more powerful than an aspirin, so I believe in 20 minutes my headache will be on. I laid hands on myself again. I said, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. You said, lay hands on the sick, Mark 16. You know, they will recover. I lay hands on myself, and I thank you in 20 minutes or less, my headache will be gone. Guess what happened? That was the first healing that I got in my own body by my, by my own faith. And you see, I decided, <laughs> go ahead and clap for him. Amen. <laughs> I was just a knucklehead that finally figured out his word would work. Amen. <laughs> you know, and, you know, and you just sit there and, you know, you start out with these little things and start putting your pressure, count it joy. Awesome, I have a headache I can overcome. Praise God, I just lost my job. I can find another one. The Lord will bless me while I work my hands. He's gonna get me another job. Praise God for, I don't know what the heck to do with my kids. Lord, thank you for giving me wisdom and I'm gonna follow that because he said he'd give me wisdom, right? You know what I mean? All these things, all these little trials, don't just push them away. Don't just like not put the word of God onto them. On everything, say what? does the word of God say about this? I remember breaking a poverty mentality, okay? Because a poverty mentality is, is I can't be generous because I have to save and I have to do all these things and saving is good and stuff like this. And so to really teach this accurately, I would probably need 10 weeks to just really describe all this to you. But let me just, just share with you what you will do if you don't believe that God can bring things to you. You won't be generous. And your heart will start to be stingy. You know, the other day I was doing lunch and Colleen and I have been talking about being more generous and things that we want to do and things like this. And I knew the girls were going to be going to that same place. So I just pulled some money out of my wallet and said, there's going to be these three girls and here's their lunch money. I'm just going to buy their lunch. The devil comes and goes, that's all the cash you have. No, liar, that's all the cash I have on me. <laughs> I can go to the bank and buy the restaurant, but that, that is a whole different story, okay? That's all the cash I have on me. I, I don't know how much the restaurant costs. I might not be able to buy it, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I could buy everything on the menu and not even think about it, okay? Been saving money for a while. Idiot, you're trying to get me to be stingy about a few dollars. Forget that. What is your inclination? If I give something away, do I look at it as losing it or do I look at it as seed? What does the word say? The word says of whatever I sow, eventually I'm going to reap on that. If I look at it as something going into ground and being a seed, come on somebody that's going to produce more, I'm more apt to be generous. Why? Because God can get me more. Right. With that attitude, Kelly and I have given a lot of things away. We tried to count the cars and then we keep finding and remembering more and more motorcycles and things like this. Just for a while in our life, it just seemed like God wanted us to give away cars. My goal is to give away houses. I want to get to the place where I'm giving away a paid for house. Where did it start? I remember the first time I felt like the Lord told me to buy somebody their lunch. Kind of dull joy. Little thing, praying for my head. What does the word say? The word says I'm healed, so I'm gonna apply that. Um, 
stinginess, giving, just whatever. You take all these little things, you start applying them. And your faith will become strong because faith works the same in every realm. I wonder who's calling my mom right now. I want to answer that, mom. Oh, she turned it off. Okay. <laughs> that would have been fun. But anyway, why are you calling mom during church? That's what I want to know. A lot of times people don't want to try to do what the word says until it's a trial that is so much bigger than they can handle and then they fail. Don't wait till it's cancer. Start applying it at all the little things. Start being a good steward. Get a budget. Start managing your money. Doing it. Why? Because that's all biblical as the Bible talks about all that. Start tithing. The Bible talks about that. Start doing all these things, and guess what? You'll be ready for when the big trial comes. My son had spinal meningitis, and he's in the hospital, and the doctors are telling us he's going to die. This is, I don't even know how many years ago now. Back in the early 90s, mid-90s. And they're giving us no hope. What does the word do? It produces hope. It shines a light in darkness. And so they air met him to the hospital. They're giving us no hope. He's in Butterworth Hospital. They got him on every machine. He can't breathe on his own. He can't do anything on his own. They got so many things poked in him and so many monitors, so much stuff. And the doctor literally said, listen, there's massive brain damage, even if he lives, which we don't think he will, you better get ready for you know, institutional care because he will never be able to take care of himself. End of the story, he's so independent now that I never hear from him. <laughs> now we gotta work on that, okay? Just so you know the end of the story, okay? Because you can, you know. So we're sitting there, this is not our first rodeo, why? Because we prayed for headaches, we prayed for other people, we prayed for pains to leave, we've prayed for this, we've spoken the word of God, we've, you know, we budgeted, we were generous, we were giving, we are doing all these things, things that would stretch us and things that would make our faith stretch and putting the hope in the word of God that if I do the word, the outcome's gonna be the word. If I'm generous, generosity is going to come back to me. Lord, you're going to make opportunities for me to increase. You're going to give me opportunities to pray for the sick and see them healed. And eventually I will be able to do the same for myself. I'll be able to do these things. We're in the stand. We're at the practice range. Tiger Woods, when he was at his peak, would hit 500 balls a day. You wonder why he was the best in the world. 500 a day. Two to three hours on the, on the practice range every day. If you're not good after that, you're in the wrong sport. Okay? Now, what would happen if you and I took that same kind of diligence in the word and meditated and quoted a scripture 500 times a day? Do you think you might become an expert? Might. So you just start where you're at and you start applying the word to everything that's going on. So our son's sitting there and they're giving us no hope. Now, of course, we're not fighting against doctors. I'm very happy for them because he'd be dead by this point if it wasn't for all those machines and all this thing going on. But we're just going like, what's going on? What do you want to see right now? And they go, the pressure in his brain is the main thing. It's destroying his brain. We need that infection, that, that inflammation. We need that pressure gone. I go, what number are you looking for? Because I don't even know what to pray for. Boo, I don't even remember what the number was. So Colleen and I go, okay. We'll just take it a step at a time. And we start speaking to his brain pressure. And we're just commanding that thing to go, quoting scriptures, doing all this stuff. One thing after another, after another, after another. And finally, you know, we, we had three nurses come in and, at different times and go, what is it we experience when we come into this room? We're all talking about it. We all love coming into this room. We experience extreme peace when we're, in, when we're in here. What is it? So we got to share with them. It's the word of God. It's the spirit of God here. God's working here. 
Colleen led one of them to the Lord. Awesome deal. So finally, the doctor goes, listen, he's got brain damage. We don't know if he's going to be able to talk. We don't know if he's ever going to wake up. We don't know if he's going to be able to swallow. We don't know anything. And I go, so the next thing would be to wake up? And he goes, yes. And our son sat up in the bed and goes, I'm hungry. <laughs> they put a little sponge on his tongue with some water to see if he could swallow. He could swallow. He's been eating ever since. What would have happened if we wouldn't have practiced with a headache? What would have happened if we wouldn't have practiced by giving little things away, then growing into bigger things and exercising our faith throughout our life up until that point? I believe our son would be dead. Am I a golfer because I play a few times a year? Or am I a golfer? because now I study the game and I actually practice. But now the question is this, are you a Christian or are you a disciple? A lot of people claim to be a Christian, but they would be like me saying I was a golfer. I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I don't even know how to do, I don't know how many ways I can use this club. I can think of seven or eight different things I can do to this club to make it do different things. I can make it go low and, you know, and low or super high. I can, you know, I can do all kinds of things with this by manipulating it different ways than I've practiced. What determines whether you're just a Christian or a disciple? How much word can you live? And when your problem comes, do you allow the word of God to shine a light into that situation and to disperse the fear and to disperse the doom? That's when you know you're starting to be a disciple. I will fight against whatever is coming in against the word of God in my life. See, I've had to do that my entire life. I've dealt with severe depression in my life. And even as a believer, it would come and attack me. And I could either yield to it or I could fight it like a demon. And I would take the word of God and fight it. And therefore, I won. I don't care how little it is, fight it like it's from hell. And you'll start to be a disciple and you'll start to have victory. The hope in you is Christ, the hope of the glory of God. Now, if you're starting to feel condemned about, man, I don't know, I don't do this, guess what? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You were bought by the blood of Jesus, cleansed, washed, and there is no sin, there is no condemnation. If you are in Christ Jesus, what do you do? You just pick up from here. Believe me, there'll be many little trials that you'll be able to apply to it and you're gonna grow. And because you've been around for a while, it'll probably grow faster than somebody that hasn't been in the word. You know what I mean? There no condemnation, you just pick it up. I mean, I could look at my life and go, I think I should be a little bit further ahead than I am. I am where I'm at and I'm going forward. You're where you're at and you're going forward. But remember this, what does the word of God say? What does it say about your business? What does it say about your life, your family, your marriage, your kids, your work, your health, your prosperity, everything? Because in reality, I can never say I'm poor ever again. Because he became poor that I became rich. But pastor, I am my financial disaster. Well, praise God, let the word of God bring a light of hope. He became poor that you could become rich. You can start to move this way. Amen. But pastor, they said I have cancer. It's okay, I've heard that, I've heard that myself. Light a word of God, start moving you this way. Put more in this way. Okay, I just got to go to the driving range, man. I don't want to. I got to make some time for this. I got covered out of my day. You know what I mean? And, you know, whatever. And so I got to go there. You know what I mean? And so what I need to do is go to the word of God and just go to the practice range. Get this word. Imagine it. See it. Picture it manifesting in your life. Start confessing it. Start using your imagination to see it as real. Start letting it affect your emotions. Start getting excited about the promise of the word of God. And you're going to start moving forward. 
And see, what Satan tried to do to come to kill you will now become the thing that's going to make you mature. Count it all joy, my brother, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, which just means the practicing, the working it out, the practicing of my faith, will produce patience. Everybody loves that word, don't they? <laughs> so there's going to be, I apply the word, and it's coming to pass. Patience. But produce patience. But let patience have its work in you. I'm going to keep standing on the word. I'm going to keep standing. I don't care what happens. I'm going to keep standing on the word. I don't care what happens. I'm going to keep applying the word. I don't care what happens. I'm getting more word in me. Patience and it's working in me. And then you come out of this thing, you're more mature. And now that next time Satan tries to bring that trial, you go, bring it. Come on. I already know how to conquer that one. And as you have all these smaller victories, when he tries to bring something big, you're ready. Amen. Yeah. You'll say, I've killed the lion. I've killed the bear. This giant is nothing. I got him. Bring it. So the deal is, let's all just become disciples. What does the word say? We're going to keep doing it. Amen. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this awesome church. I thank you for your blessings that's upon us. I love you and thank you. You're just so good. Help us to walk in the fullness of your goodness, Lord. Help us to walk in the fullness of your goodness. We absolutely love you. Lord, I want it to be hard for anybody to go to hell from New Ego. And that's just going to really come as we all just are living that light and bringing that hope to everywhere we go. Just being your light to the world. Loving the one that's in front of us and helping them, bringing them, giving them the kingdom. Today, Christ, we declare him in his name. And if you're not born again, you've never accepted the forgiveness of your sins. He paid the price for it on the cross. You can receive that if you desire. And you're just confessing him as Lord, recognizing that you need him and you're willing to give your life over to him. You can do that today. In fact, if you want to do that, would you just raise your hand real high and just let me see your hand. Okay, cool. Love it. Proud of you. Anybody in here need a healing in their body and you would like somebody to pray with you? Would you raise your hand? Okay, very cool. Very cool. All over the place. Good, 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 good. Here's the deal. Let's just pray that prayer of salvation just real quick. And for those of you who raised your hand, we'll, we'll give you some instruction here in just a minute. And those of you watching on Facebook, pray the same thing. Just say with me, dear God, I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he died on the cross to pay for my sin. I've sinned. I need to be forgiven. And I recognize it is in you. I need you. And I recognize that you are our savior. And I accept you. I give you my life. I receive your life. From this day forward, I'm yours. Thank you for receiving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Amen. So if you prayed that for the first time, there's a, can you bring the 41411 up there? There's a, um, a text I would like you to do, and it's to 41411. If you don't have the ability to text, get an usher. Tell them you want the information that we'd be giving you here. What will happen is you'll go to a spot. It'll ask for your email. From there, we will send you seven days of devotional. You'll see my little face for seven days in a row. That's worth it right there. So you'll see me for seven days in a row just telling you a little bit more about the decision you just made. If you got born again and never did that, go ahead. Go to that website. Just put it in there. See what the devotional is all about. Maybe you'll share it with your friends. If you lead somebody to the Lord out in, out in the gas station or the grocery store, have them go to the 41411 text, got saved. The words got saved you'll get that instruction. Amen. For those of you who need prayer for healing, I want you to come up forward. You guys are going to be sticking around, be able to pray. Scott and anybody else that's here team-wise, guys up here, whatever. All right, we'll pray for you. 
Father, thank you, and I just thank you for this church, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May you be filled with his spirit. May you walk in the blessings of the Lord. May you be rich, quick, bright, sharp, good-looking, and very rich in a major blessing. That's what you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Yay. Go have a great day.